So we are in the book of Acts. If you'll turn your Bibles to Acts 4, Acts chapter 4, that's on page 833 in your Bibles that are on the edge of your seats here. And we're going verse by verse through the book of Acts. And I think it's important to do that from time to time, to go verse by verse through a book, because then it makes us teach on things we don't necessarily want to teach on. You, yeah. you, you have to, <laughs> whatever is coming up is coming up. And I always get the hard ones. Yes, I always arrange it that way, I that know. you get the difficult ones. But uh, it helps us to look at things we don't normally do, because the worst thing you can do is just preach on the topics you like and then cherry pick the Bible verses you like, and then you end up just reading into the Bible, whatever you want to read into the Bible. Today's passage in Acts chapter 4, verse 23 and following, we're going to focus on the topic of predestination. And you might think, well, that's theological. That doesn't matter. It's not a big deal, whatever, if there is, if there isn't. But the truth is, what you think about predestination affects how you make decisions. It affects how you see the nature of God. It affects how you go through life and how you see the story of your life moving forward. So we're going to look at that, and you might think, well, this is just a, um, just a Christian thing, but the truth is, even secular agnostics deal with this issue because there's something called determinism. Not just for believers, there's something called determinism. And determinism, in philosophical terms, is the idea that everything is physical cause and effect. Every effect has a cause, and even your brain is just a complicated cause and effect thing, and you don't really have any free will. There's a whole philosophical school that says we don't have free will because everything is physical and everything is a reaction, a chemical reaction, and you're just doing what your chemicals and your atoms are telling you to do. So uh, this is an issue for believers, and unbelievers. How much power do we have over our future? How much free will do we really have? And how much can we affect the course and the story of our lives? And so this is much more than just a philosophical thing. This affects your temperament, your spiritual temperament, your decision-making temperament, and all of those things. I also want to let everyone know even those of you listening to this years in advance, sometime in the, I don't know, next decade or whatever on YouTube, that there's room for disagreement on this issue. This is not a salvation issue. This is not one of those go to heaven or go to hell issues. And it's one of those things where we can disagree. And you can disagree with what, how I interpret this passage. And that's just fine. We can disagree anyways. But uh, especially on things like this, you can certainly disagree on this. So if by the end of this message you're thinking, I don't think so, that's just fine. It affects our decisions. What we believe about predestination, what we believe about destiny, what we believe about how God plans things affects how we make our day-to-day -day decisions and affects our view of God's nature. And we're going to get into that here in just a moment. But let's look at the passage itself in Acts 4, verse 23 and following. Next week, we're going to talk about poverty and what can be done about poverty because poverty is the topic of the next few paragraphs, the end of chapter 4. It's one of the thorniest problems in the human race is what do we do about the huge disparity in resources and um, capacity that people have. So let's look at 4.23 and follow. Let me give you a little update for what's happening here in the book. It'll help you understand the storyline. Peter and John, this is all after Jesus. This is the early church. This is the Acts of the Apostles. This is the history of the church as it's getting started. And Peter and John are two of the main leaders. They were in Jesus' inner circle. When Jesus went to raise the dead, when Jesus went to face his own death, he brought with him Peter, James, and John. I'm not sure where James is, but Peter and John are here. And they go out into a mass public area, the Solomon's porch, and there's a crippled man there, and they pray over him, and he gets up and starts dancing and walking around. Now, healing, even those of you in the medical profession know that it's not just a physical thing. There's a lot to it, and these kind of things happen all the time. Most of us have experienced really strange healing things in our lives. And so they pray over this guy, or they, they tell him to get up and walk, and he does. This causes a stir because they're doing it in the name of Jesus. 
And Jesus had just been crucified recently before that by the authorities in the same city. And they get dragged in front of the same people that crucified Jesus. And Tamara had a great teaching last week about how the Holy Spirit had changed Peter because when Jesus was crucified, he was flaking. And all of a sudden, he's standing up to the same authorities that killed Jesus just a few weeks later. So we have this going on. They basically get hauled into the home office or the jail or the authorities or whatever you want to call it. They get questioned and they get held overnight in jail. The people realize they can't do anything about it. They, they're not going to stop these guys. These guys are too confident. And very often, folks, when you're facing authorities who are treating you like a kid, you ever been with a bureaucrat where it's, it feels like it's a child, a child kid thing where they're treating you like a kid? Um, generally, the more confidence you show in a situation like that, the less authority they feel like they have. People often have only the authority that you give them. And Peter and John aren't giving them any authority. And they're not giving an inch, and they realize we can't do anything with these guys, so they release them. They go back to their friends, and this is where we pick up the story today. When they were released, verse 23, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. Verse 24, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. I bolded the word sovereign. Predestination has a lot to do with the sovereignty of God. How much is God in charge of things that happen to you? Where is God right now in Florida? Is he just saying, oh, this is just a natural event, I have nothing to do with this, or is he involved in the hurricane? Where is God when things are happening in your life? Where is God, not just with big things, but little things, like where is that other black sock? It's disappeared. I don't know what happens to those other socks, but they do tend to disappear from time to time. To what extent is God involved in the big things and the little things in life? Is he involved directly? Is he, as what's her name saying, watching from a long ways away? What was Bette Midler, didn't she sing a song about God's watching you from a distance? Or is God involved in every little thing? If we pray for a parking space, is he going to pay attention to that? Or is that just something that... Uh, he does. Parking, I hope so. <laughs> I really hope he does help us with parking spots because because the, the air show is going to be really bad. So we're going we're, we're, we're to have to pray for parking spots near our place. So repeat after me. The sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God is a big issue, a big issue. when it comes to predestination. To what extent does God direct your decisions? To what extent are your decisions independent of what God would have you do? To what extent is God's plan involved in all of those things? Verse 25, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, now they're quoting from the Psalms. And back then, they could actually sing the Psalms because they knew the tunes. We've lost the tunes. You might have heard of Hildegard von Bingen about a thousand years ago. She designed the way we write notes. And before that, people didn't record the tones in music, and so we just have the words. We just have the lyrics, basically, from the Psalms, but we don't have the actual music. But they would be able to sing these tunes. Why do the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly, in this city, Jerusalem, they're gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, Jewish and Roman authorities, along with the Gentiles, the nations, and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now, this is an interesting concept. Predestined. Predestination shows up. The word shows up in many Bible translations in quite a few places that are pretty important in the New Testament. Now there is a theology, and it's called Calvinism, that has a really strong emphasis on predestination. In fact, they go to the point where they say that some people are predestined for heaven, some people are predestined from hell, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just the way it is. And God knows what he's doing. And a strong Calvinist will say, if somebody is going through a tragedy, well, God is teaching us something here. We need to figure out what that is because God 
does everything. They have a very high view of, what was that word again? Sovereignty of God. They have a very high view of the sovereignty of God, a very low view of human agency. Human agency is the ability to decide for ourselves what we do. And the sovereignty of God is everything's planned. There's going to be a certain future. God knows exactly what it is. And it's all for our own good. We just don't understand sometimes what our own good is. And the pilgrims who came to America were hardline Calvinists. And they have sort of stamped American thinking with a lot of the way that goes. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. These authorities were threatening us, but uh, give us boldness to speak against it. They only have the same authority, the amount of authority that we give to them. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus, like the healing of the lame man. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. How many were filled with the Holy Spirit? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. These people were just filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It's not a one-time thing. I once was working at a big conference in St. Paul, Minnesota, and uh, I had one of these earphones on and a little radio because I was in charge of the team that put on this big conference with 3,000 people, and it was a lot of fun. And I got through my little microphone, we've got a malfunction with one of our ushers. I said, okay, it's by door number or whatever. I went over to the door, and there was this crappy-looking usher. He had a dark blue suit, and he showed the bulletins that we were handing out, and people, kids had made paper airplanes out of them. These kids, we, we've never let kids in here. This is awful. Look what they're doing. These things cost money. We should charge the parents. I said, brother, we're in the love club here. We're, just, we're here to help people and be nice. We're not here to, you know, to be the, the police of the playground. Just, these are just kids. You make a couple paper airplanes. It's not the, That's terrible. I says, brother, I said, fruit of the spirit, gentleness, patience, kindness, self-control. Are you, in, are you implying I'm not filled with the Spirit? I was filled with the Spirit in 1971. And I said, well, he's all leaked out. We need to, we need to, <laughs> we need to refill him here. Do you want to pray for that? And the truth is, we need to, just like our gas tank, we need to be filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit. It's not just a one-time thing. We need to continue to be seek, we need to continue to seek to be filled with his presence and with his power. And uh, here, these people getting filled with the Spirit again, just shortly after Pentecost. Peter, we think, was filled with the Spirit in the book of Acts at least four or five times. So it's, it's free refills. I just came back from England. I like a lot of things about England. I don't like the fact they drive on the left. You ever cross the street in a place where people drive on the left, you're looking the wrong way, the whole thing? I mean, I know you've been there. And uh, yeah, it's a lot to like about England. One thing I don't like is the size of their drinks. It was their breakfast, and they give these little itty bitty glasses for juice. And the guy who was with said, can I get a bigger glass? And she, waitress just looked down and said, no, but you could have two of these. You know, it's just, this, this, it, and they charge you for every, you get more coffee, they charge you again. You get another soda, they charge you again. It's like four ninety five for a little Pepsi. You know, it's, just, it's just crazy. And what I like about the Holy Spirit is, I know this is politically incorrect, but... Uh, God's American when it comes to uh, the Holy Spirit. It's free refills, you know, just uh, free refills. You, you go to a truck stop in Butte, Montana, and some, some lady with a pink suit and orange hair is going to come. She'll fill the coffee as long as you sit there. It costs the same, you know, and, uh, you know what I mean. So th they're getting refilled, and they get boldness here. Now, here's a phrase which I hear a lot as a pastor. And it's a phrase that may or may not be true, not necessarily in the Bible, but everything happens for a reason. Who here has heard that phrase? That's a complicated thing to say. If somebody's kid gets run over and you say, well, everything happens for a reason, that's not going to be helpful. We've had some really bad things happen to people in this church. I mean, when you found Mike, uh, if somebody came up to you and said, oh, everything happens for a reason. Yeah, you would have killed him. That's right. It's just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I understand what people are trying to say 
And I'm not saying it's a false statement. I'm just saying it's a complicated statement. And it has a lot to do with the sovereignty of God. It has a lot to do with predestination. It has a lot to do with destiny. It has a lot to do with how much freedom we have in our lives and how much control God has over what happens. I don't know this for sure, but I know that within a bike ride of where we're sitting right now, some bad stuff's happening. There's probably some kid getting abused. There's probably some nasty stuff happening. I saw a couple walk by the house on the way back from the air show, and they were on a really bad date because she was walking out ahead of him and he was walking behind trying to make up, and they were yelling and telling all kinds of terrible stuff to each other. And um, yeah, it was ugly to watch. There's ugly stuff happening. And I can't imagine that it's God's will that some of these horrible things are happening or that cities are getting flattened in Ukraine right now or that uh, homes are being destroyed in, in Florida. It's not that simple. So when we look at this issue, we have to look at the sovereignty of God and to what extent is God involved in things. Now the Bible, unfortunately, gives us two different ways to look at this. The Bible is full of paradox and the Bible is full of tension. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, was asked to write a systematic theology. He says there is no systematic theology in the Bible. The Bible's full of tension, the Bible's full of paradox, and that's why it rings so true because that's the way our lives are. It mirrors the fact that we live, we see through a glass darkly in this world. and We don't fully understand what's going on. What I like about our, our Foursquare faith family, for those of you new to the church, we're part of a, a faith family called the Foursquare Church, and Whenever somebody takes a verse out of the Bible and sees the whole world through that verse, they get reminded in our tradition that you have to read the whole Bible through the whole Bible. You can't just pick and choose a certain verse and see everything through that knot hole. You have to look at the whole Bible to interpret the whole Bible. And I think that that's a very helpful, helpful thing. The pro verses, pro predestination, are in Romans, Ephesians, and Galatians. You can take a picture of that or write it down if you want. Um, I quit writing things down like that, and I realized that people are just taking pictures of things, and it's so much easier. But uh, these verses are very strong predestination verses. Like, God is really sovereign. God is choosing everything. God was using Herod, and God was using Pilate, Pontius Pilate to, to crucify Jesus. That was part of his plan. And these verses, if you just read those three verses, you would think, oh my goodness, everything's planned. Everything's destiny. Everything is a certain way. On the other hand, Genesis, Exodus, and Jonah have God changing his mind. And one even says he repented of what he had done and decided to do something else. And that's what the word says. So, if we believe in the sovereignty of God, do we believe that God has the authority to change his mind, or does he have to stick with what he said before? Does, if you really believe in a powerful God, you have to believe in a God that's able to say, okay, I'm going to change my direction here because he has every right to change his direction. This is his universe, for goodness sake. If he wants to do that, that's his thing. So basically, when people fight over predestination, they use these six verses, and they quote the ones that they like, and they they go just kind of filter out the ones they don't like. And I think it's important to see the whole Bible. The ones that are contra tend to call into question whether or not everything is preordained. And the other ones tend to show that, yeah, God has a plan here. And in some ways, there's a lot of truth to both. Let's look at the meanings of the word predestination that was in verse 28. We look at verse 28, and there's lots of ways to say that in English, but uh, Many English Bibles say predestination, and the word is pro horizo. We get the word horizon from that. The horizon is the line between the sky and the ground that you see, or the, the sea and the, and the sky when you're on a, on a boat, the horizon. Pro horizo, it's a line. Marking actively. Horizo means to mark a line. Pro horizo means to intentionally mark a line. But God is intentionally drawing a line here and making a design, a blueprint of how things are going to go. Here's the problem. Peter and John weren't speaking Greek. Luke wrote it in Greek, but they were speaking Aramaic. And their Aramaic was not recorded. We can only guess what it was, but the equivalent is Rasham and Kadam. 
marking before, marking in the past, already predetermined. So picture marking, and both words have to do with marking and drawing and designing a path. When you're about to do something, you draw a picture of it first before you build something. If you're going to build some steps on your porch, you're going to draw with graph paper, whatever, you're going to draw some things and put it together. And so it's like he's designing, planning ahead of time. Now, there's some positives to hardline predestination. And here they are. You give God a strong sense of sovereignty. And that makes a lot of sense because God is way above our thinking. And you say, well, if things are, aren't working out, it's just because we don't understand and God's got a better plan. God's got a bigger plan. Also, it's easier to teach about grace if you're talking about sovereignty. How much of you has to be involved to get saved? Do you have to pray a certain prayer? Do you have to uh, act a certain way? Do you have to believe in your heart? All those kind of things. And the Bible talks about that. But it kind of makes the decider us as to who's saved rather than God. Now, John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, I chose you. That's what Jesus says to his disciples. You did not choose me, I chose you. And there's something to that. And so if you believe in a hardline predestination, hardline sovereignty of God, hardline Calvinism, it's going to be easy to talk about grace because it's, you have nothing to do with your salvation. You were just chosen. You were just chosen to be saved. And you just give God all the glory and all the credit. And you don't take any credit of your own. You can say everything happens for a reason and mean it. You can say we just don't understand the reason. God has a bigger plan than we do. There's got to be something good that comes out of this. And also when your life is falling apart and unraveling, that, that happened to me in 2013 where everything went wrong, and we've got those seasons where everything goes wrong, it helps to have that strong sense of destiny. Well, God still has a plan somehow. I don't understand it. My life is a mess. It's an absolute trash heap. It's a, it's a trash fire. And somehow, God knows what he's doing. It helps to be able to say that in a situation like that. Negatives. You really can't get around blaming God for some bad stuff. If God is sovereign over everything, then yeah, he's sending the hurricane. He's, uh, you know, sending the terrorists, sending everybody. And yeah, he sent Herod, and yeah, he sent uh, Pilate, but is he sending people right now to rob houses? He's sending, it, it, it gets pretty bad. And you end up blaming God for some really nasty things. People getting stomach cancer and, and whatever. It's just, it's, it can be real sketchy. You end up with fatalism. It doesn't matter what I do because it's all going to turn out the same anyways. And people who believe in a strong sense of predestination almost always have a very weak prayer life because they don't believe they can affect the outcome. God's going to do what he's going to do. I just buried a, a I didn't bury him, but a, a friend of mine just died in Florida who was a, a pastor. Great guy, great guy but he kind of leaned this way and he said he'd quit praying because God knows what he's going to do. And if you're a hard line on this side, you, you really do believe that God's in charge. What difference does it make if I talk to him? I'm just going to let things happen because God's in charge. Do you see where that's the negative side of it? I've rarely met a hard line Calvinist with a powerful prayer life because they end up giving up. They just say, well, God's just in charge. That's just the way that is. It's going to happen the way it's going to happen. God knows better than I do, and so I may as well let it go. Hardline free will people. These are called open theists, if you want to look this up. Open theism is a belief that there's many futures that could happen, not just one. And there's lots of options open, and God doesn't know the future because that's unknowable because he doesn't know what we're going to decide. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse, therefore choose life. And he's hoping we choose life. And he's always willing to intervene and help out, but it really does give us a lot of freedom. We call that agency, the ability to change your life around you, the ability to have some power over whether's, what's going on in your life. The positives are there's a strong sense of human responsibility. 
if you're a hardline predestination person, if you sin, well, that was God's plan. That was God's plan anyways. You, you really had no choice. That was, God will make something good out of it, but that's just the way that is. People who believe in open theism have a strong sense of human responsibility. You are responsible for the decisions you make because they're really free. And you really do have to, our whole legal system assumes this. Our whole legal system assumes that murder that is premeditated is even worse. Why? Because you made that choice on your own. That wasn't something God made you do. So there's a high sense of personal responsibility. And there's a high sense of personal responsibility in the Bible. God holds Israel responsible for the things they do. And if it was predestined, why would he hold them responsible? If it was just part of the plan and they were reading the script, then, you know, what difference does it make what they do? It gives God the free will. It gives God free will. Open theism gives God the free will to adapt and change as he feels like it. In some ways, open theists believe in a higher sovereignty of God than people who believe in sovereignty of God. Does that make any sense? Because they believe he can change his mind. Is that a... I know that's convoluted. Are you guys following me on that? It's a, they believe that God has the ability to act dynamically and not just in a static preordained. Well, God would never do that. Well, how do you know? If God wants to change his mind on Thursday, who, is, who are we to tell him off? You know, if he wants to do that, that's, that's his thing. Yeah, he's not just a, he's not just a, a, a vending machine where he's just going to do the same thing if we put the, the quarters in the right way. There's, he can, and he's a big personality in the Bible. And he often does things people don't expect and acts that way in our lives too. The problem of evil. Open theists are better with the problem of evil. Because if something terrible happens, they don't blame God. They don't say, well, it was God's plan that uh, 9-11 happened. They would say, these are evil people doing evil things and they don't end up blaming God for things. It's the human responsibility thing again. And people who believe in open theism have stronger prayer lives because they really believe that they can change where things are going with their prayers. You understand the tension here? And this is the tension we live in every day. The downsides of open theism, God doesn't know what's going to happen. In true open theism, lots of things can happen. And God has to be able to deal with lots of different eventualities and have the bandwidth to deal with lots of outcomes and react to lots of different outcomes. God doesn't know exactly what's going to happen next October. That depends on what human beings decide because human beings are truly free. And if they're truly free, then lots of different things can happen between now and then. Negatives. Open theists have a really hard time with the predestination passages because the predestination passages are in the New Testament and they're pretty strong. That God preordained certain things to happen. So you have to deal with that. It's harder to trust in difficult times. It's harder to say God's got this if you don't think he's in charge of all of our decisions. If people are free to do terrible things and that's not part of God's plan, then when your life is coming apart, it's really difficult. You can't just say, well, in some way God's got this because you're not sure. Maybe the people around here are just goofing up. They're, they're messing up and it's causing all this stuff and it may not go well. God may not come through on that because he doesn't know how it's going to end up and all of that stuff. So some practicalities. Recognize the tension in the Bible on this issue. There's a lot of tension in this. Um, I would love to be able to blend the two somehow but it's like two different parts of a magnet. They kind of push against each other. But it has a lot to do with how we think about God when things are going badly in our lives. Is this a result of human decisions? Is this a result of God's plan? Um, how do we respond to this? Are my prayers going to make a difference? Like my friend in Florida didn't believe our prayers were going to make a difference because he had a very high view of the sovereignty of God. It wasn't because he was an atheist. It's because he thought God knows better, so why should I... Why should I bother praying? So there's a lot of tension here. I think the key is, I know I say this all the time, life is like a bowling alley. Just avoid the gutter balls. And the gutter balls are super extreme views either way. You can have a super extreme sovereignty of God view and say, well, God gave that little girl stomach cancer. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's not God's nature. 
or the other one, you know, it's kind of like God isn't even in charge. It's kind of all up to us. If it's going to be, it's up to me, you know, that kind of thing. And so just keep the bowling ball on the wood and try to hit a few pins and do the best you can with this and recognize that this is challenging for people of faith. This is just a very challenging thing to work through. Recognize the limits of your will. So I believe in free will. Okay, good for you. Um, Most of the things I do, I'm not deciding to do them. I'm doing them out of habit. When I wash my hair, and there's less and less of it all the time, but when when I'm washing my hair, it... I do certain things, and I couldn't tell you right now exactly how I do it, but I do it the same way every time. Much of what we do is just habit. How we swallow our food, how we walk, how we move, how we respond to people, even our language. Much of what we do is just patterns. And we follow patterns. You can go through the whole day without even thinking sometimes, just doing, just going on autopilot. How many of you have been driving for a long time and you realize that an hour later you haven't thought about driving? It happens. You're just, you're just automatically doing what you do. Our free will doesn't un- enter into our lives very often. Very, very seldom do we actually decide what we're going to do. We just go through the motions and kind of do what we do as we do it. And our free will isn't really that big of a factor in our lives. Much of what we do is just brain patterns that we follow as we go through things. On the other hand, someone said this to me once and it makes so much sense to me. When something terrible happens and someone says, well, that's just God's will, I always say to myself, God can't give you what he doesn't have. God can't give us disease. God can't give us uh, corruption. God can't give us injustice. God can't give us... God can't give us what he doesn't have. And he doesn't have bad stuff. And so the Bible verse, John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I come to give you life. I don't think that God is killing, stealing, and destroying. And so I lean a little bit more towards the open theist side than the the Calvinist side, but please hear me. I'm not telling you to do that because we all have to work this out on our own. We have to kind of struggle through all of those issues. How much is God in charge of your day today and how much of it is really up to you as to what you do? How much of it is planned and how much of it isn't? How much is that pro horizon, how much is drawn out ahead of time? And I do think we have destinies. I really do think that we live into a destiny that God has planned for us. I think it's more dynamic than just static. I think it changes from time to time. And uh, it's not just one simple flow chart. Look at nature. Who believes that God created nature? Is there a single straight line in nature? Even light gets bent by gravity. I mean, look at trees. They grow in all kinds of different directions. That's how God works. God doesn't necessarily work in logical and straight lines with us. And we have to kind of struggle through that. Here's my final advice to you. Pray like an open theist. In other words, pray like you you make a big difference when you pray because that's going to help your prayer life. But trust like a predestination fan. Trust that God is somehow in charge. And if you can do those two things, I know that those two are intention, but I find that those two together make for a dynamic and trusting life in God. And if nothing else, I invite the worship team up here. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That God can take good things and bad things and make great things out of them. And I'm not saying he sent the bad things. Hardline predestination, people would say, yes, he did. He sent that for your own good to teach you a lesson. Well, I don't believe that, but I do believe that God can make really good things out of really bad things, wherever they came from. In fact, the worst things that happen to you, the more material God has to work with. You ever notice that people who have had the most messed up lives have the best testimonies? Because God has a lot of building material. And those of you who've had kind of, you know, pretty good lives, you often don't have a great testimony because you've just been, you know, doing some good stuff along the way and, and uh, you wish that you'd been thrown in a dumpster after being drunk and then God got a hold of you and you quit selling drugs and everything else and, you know, got out of human trafficking and became a missionary. You know, that, that's, all, that's all great. But 
God has a lot more to work with. The more mess you have, the more God has to work with in your life. Let's read that first outline out loud together. One, two, three. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. So my final advice, and this is just human advice, pray like an open theist and trust like a predestination fan. Let's pray.